here, given the unusual nature of the talks that I'm giving, I'm, you know, I was kind of wondering if anyone was going to show up for lecture number two. So we'll see how things go today, and then we'll see if anybody shows up for lecture number three. Honestly, thank you very much for for being here, for putting up with the fact that this has to be done over Zoom. I so wish that I were there in person to be able to meet you and have all those conversations that, that really make a conference worthwhile. But let's do what we can with what we've got. Recall where we were at uh, yesterday with the outline. We gave a, a sort of a weird introduction, a weird motivation based on uh, a type of calculus that, that nobody knows having to do with Euler characteristic and using the fact that that derives from sheaf theory as a launching point to talk about a very simple version of sheaf theory called cellular sheaves. And we spent most of yesterday just doing a bunch of simple examples, one or two of which we're going to see again today. I want to start off today's lecture by asking the question, the honest question, what is it that's useful about sheaves? It was, oh, let's see, I don't know, it was almost uh, 15 years ago that I started trying to make sheaf theory relevant to people in applied mathematics. And of course, as you might expect, I got a lot of pushback from people in applications. They didn't want to hear about sheaves. But I also got a, a no small amount of pushback from the experts in sheaf theory, some of whom took me aside and told me, you know, that sheaf theory is just a language. And it's not actually useful in and of itself. It's just a language. It's like category theory, just a language, not actually useful. I don't really agree with those statements, and I'm going to be arguing for the utility of sheaves throughout what I'm talking about. But in order to make that argument, I, I need to be honest and say, what is it that's useful? I think what's useful is the entire edifice of sheaf theory that has been built up not so much in the cellular context in which we've been talking, but there's a huge amount of theory out there. Yesterday, we talked about global sections of sheaves, choices of elements in all the stocks that are globally compatible. That's just the beginning of the more general sheaf cohomology. That's the zeroth dimensional sheaf cohomology. And that's really such an undervalued idea in applied domains. Of course, we mathematicians appreciate the utility and the beauty of cohomology. The rest of the world is just starting to wake up to it. But sheaf theory has so much more. There are operations on sheaves. You can talk about maps between sheaves, sheaf morphisms. You can, given a map between spaces, you can push sheaves forward. You can pull sheaves back. This is incredibly important. This means you can do things like talk about sequences or filtrations of sheaves. And I think there have been one or two talks here about things like persistent homology. That idea of a filtration of sheaves allows you to do things like persistent sheaf cohomology and the likes. But there's even much more within sheaf theory. There are all of the fundamental operations. There are tensor products on sheaves, which is something like a, a convolution, a way to combine data. And perhaps the most important idea is that of derived functors. That's a little bit beyond what I'm going to be getting into today along with things like projective, injective resolutions, ways of decomposing sheaves into simple pieces for analysis. I will say that the Euler calculus that we talked about yesterday, Shapira's original definition for the Euler integral was not combinatorial. It was rather in the language of sheaf theory. 
that the Euler integral is the right derived push forward of the map from the base space to a point. That's very compact, very sophisticated, very powerful. It's also very hard to uh, grasp unless you're really into sheaf theory, which is part of the reason why his work sort of lay undiscovered for 10 or 20 years. Nevertheless, huge edifice of ideas and principles that really have not been put to proper use in applications. I'd like to get started on that path. Before I do so, let me tell you a little bit about how I view the different aspects of sheaves and, and what they're good for. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let my Twitter spirit uh, speak here and I'm gonna draw a political compass for sheaves, where along the one axis, we have the algebraic versus the geometric properties of sheaves. Now, on the other axis, there are structural properties of sheaves. Those are like the category theoretic properties. And I think on the other end of the spectrum from the structural properties are the obstructive properties. The way that sheaves are programs that encode problems. The way that sheaf cohomology gives the obstructions to running those programs, to solving those problems. If I look back at all of the papers where people have tried to use sheaf theory in various applications, and there's no small amount of such papers, then a lot of them lie in this quadrant of the political compass. They're, they're strongly algebraic and strongly uh, category theoretic or structural. In, in my thinking, I've been moving much more towards the first quadrant, where it's the obstructions that are really where the key applications lie. And it's in the geometric aspects of the sheaves that a lot of those applications can really shine. Now, I realize I'm being vague and overly general here. So let me drill down to some specifics. And let me say that today, we're mostly going to do geometric properties of sheaves. So let's do some geometry. And if I had to encapsulate today's lecture in one word, that word is Laplacians. And I use the plural very intentionally because even though the idea of a Laplacian is simplex, the nature of the Laplacian is complex. It has many emanations. There are lots of different flavors of Laplacians out there. There is, of course, the analytic Laplacian, what we teach to our students when they're doing calculus or partial differential equations. But there's also the topological or the Hodge Laplacian, Durham cohomology, all of that kind of stuff. I'm going to assume that everybody in this room who knows about that loves that because it's really beautiful. But there's also perhaps the most useful Laplacian of all, the combinatorial Laplacian or the graph theoretic Laplacian. This is something that if you don't know well, you're going to want to know well. The graph Laplacian is, is classic and just fundamental in modern applied mathematics. The idea is you've got a graph and the graph Laplacian is a, a matrix, a square matrix on the vertex set. The definition is simple. You can write the graph Laplacian as the degree matrix. That's a diagonal matrix that just records the degree of each vertex minus the adjacency matrix that records uh, a one whenever you have an edge between two vertices. So you're seeing this uh, square matrix. It's got some positive diagonal elements and then some negative ones off the diagonal corresponding to the edges. OK, now you can also write this combinatorial Laplacian as the boundary matrix between the, the edges and the vertices uh, times its transpose. And that's really the definition that if you don't know the graph Laplacian, 
this one ought to ring an algebraic topological bell. All right. Well, so what? So what? Why, why is it that we teach the graph Laplacian to uh, sophomores in engineering and computer science? It's so useful. Used all the time for things like uh, graph partitioning, spectral graph theory, clustering, distributed consensus, and more recently, the graph Laplacian, super, super useful in graph signal processing with lots of applications to machine learning. Okay. But again, that's just one type of Laplacian. There's also the Laplacian that we teach in multivariable calculus that I'm teaching in multivariable calculus this coming semester when we do differential forms, which is the way that we teach multivariable calculus at Penn at least in a simplified version. Recall the classic story. You've got a manifold, let's say, orientable, compact, finite dimensional, although we can bend those rules, but let's keep it simple. And then you look at the Durham complex. You look at the real valued functions and then the one forms, the two forms, etc. The exterior derivative gives you a cochain complex. And if you have a little bit of geometry on your manifold, then you can define a Hodge star, which allows you to take a, a transpose or an adjoint to that exterior derivative, from which you can form the Hodge Laplacian, which on K forms means you, you go to the right one step with the derivative, you go to, to the left, and then you add to it going to the left and then going to the right, the classical second derivative formula from partial differential equations. Okay, now the cool thing, the classical thing, the thing we all know is that the harmonic forms, those forms that are in the kernel of the Laplacian, that's really computing the cohomology of your manifold. You can get at the topology of your base space by looking at the harmonic differential Forms. That's the Hodge theorem. Very big idea that you can understand the topology of a smooth manifold via its harmonic forms. Okay. Again, with the calculus, we're building up to the connections between these different Laplacians and then pushing it over to sheaves. Now, one of the things that is really exciting in the applied math world when it comes to the graph Laplacian is something called spectral graph theory. The idea that if you look at the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix, of this graph Laplacian, then you get information about the graph. Almost in the same way that looking at the Hodge Laplacian gives you information about the underlying manifold. So, for example, classic application, the number of zero eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian tells you how many connected components there are to the graph. When this is taught in, uh, in graph theory courses, it's usually taught with surprise and awe and wow, isn't this cool? This is amazing that the, the zero eigenvalues tell you something about this. We topologists are less impressed by that particular fact. You could sort of see where it comes from. But, but what's really cool is that if you make things a little fuzzy, if you want to talk about, is my graph connected or is it disconnected or is it almost disconnected? then you can get at that by saying, oh, how close are these eigenvalues to zero? What's the, what's the size of the smallest non-zero eigenvalue? That gives you some sort of degree of disconnectedness. That's a cool idea. That I think we could make use of. There's a ton of other things that you do in spectral graph theory. Besides uh, partitioning, there's sparsification, that is trying to approximate a graph with a much smaller graph that still has a close spectrum in the graph Laplacian. This is very cool, lots of things. 
recently there's been a lot of generalizations of this to higher dimensional things let's say that you've got a a graph where instead of um, just having scalar values on top of the vertices you have let's say orthogonal matrices something like that then within the past decade the graph connection Laplacian is something that's been used in a lot of applications all of these generalizations every single one is just a specialized case of the overarching Laplacian that ties together all of the Laplacians that we've been talking about today. What follows for the rest of today's talk pretty much is all joint work with Jacob Hansen. And this begins with the idea of a Laplacian for cellular sheaves. Recall yesterday that when we had a sheaf of vector spaces over a cell complex, we had a co-chain complex. The data over the vertex, pardon me, the vertices, the data over the edges, the data over the two cells, and the usual sort of co-boundary operator where we use the sheaf maps to map data from cells to cells gives us a co-chain complex. Now, if these vector spaces that we're working with, if these stocks have a little bit of geometry to them, let's say that the vector spaces are based, they have some canonical basis, or some other way of sticking some implicit geometry in there, then we can compute an adjoint to the co-boundary operator. We can take the transposes of all the associated matrices, and we can, in the same exact way, form the Hodge Laplacian. When we do so, a lot of interesting things start happening. First of all, this sheaf Laplacian really is a generalization of the graph Laplacian. If you take a graph and you put the simplest possible sheaf on there, just a one-dimensional vector space over each vertex, each edge, and identity maps tying everything together, something called the constant sheaf. Then the sheaf Laplacian in degree zero is exactly the graph Laplacian. That's exactly what it is. But we can do this for arbitrary sheaves over arbitrary cell complexes in arbitrary grading. So the idea is let's take everything that's been done in spectral graph theory, all of those cool applications, and then lift them not just to graphs with some higher dimensional uh, data, some vector value data over top of it. No, 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 no. To very general systems where we can have really just arbitrary sheaves over these complexes. I could tell you the beginning of this story, but I think there's a lot left to be done. Let's start with some of the basic results. The first result is going to be a generalization of the Hodge theorem. Namely, that if you take the kernel of the sheaf Laplacian, what does it compute? It computes cohomology. The cohomology of what? It computes the cohomology of the sheaf. This is the generalization of the, the, the Durham story and the Hodge theorem there. Instead of just computing the cohomology of your base space, you're getting the cohomology of the data structure that lives above that complex. So the harmonic cochains are the important thing. Furthermore, since we have a little bit of geometry on these cochains, we can do things like take inner products. And if we use the Laplacian in grading zero to define a, an inner product on zero cochains, I can define that really easily in terms of the co-boundary operator. Then just like in spectral graph theory, this gives us a distance on how close a choice of data is to being a global section. Maybe you've got uh, choices of data over all your vertices and 
it doesn't quite match up. Maybe these are samples from sensors in some distributed system, and it's the measurements aren't compatible. There's some errors in there somewhere. If you want to say how close you are to having a true section, then you can use the Laplacian to define that. And just as with spectral graph theory, that's going to be a useful idea. Now, we've got a lot to do today, and I can't drill down through all of the different results that Jacob and I have started to try to put spectral sheaf theory on some footing. And this is not a conference on spectral graph theory. It's not assumed that anyone knows anything about it. So I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole. But if you've heard of things like effective resistance or expander graphs, things like that, then all of these concepts can be lifted from graph theory and combinatorics up to much more general cellular sheaves. And the implications of this, I, I think, have not really yet propagated. Of the results that are here, there's really only one that I want you to remember or pay attention to. And this has to do with the idea of harmonic extension. Let's say that you have a, a cochain over a subset of your complex, over a subcomplex A. And you want to know, does the choice of data over this smaller subset extend to a harmonic cochain? If I have a local section, does it extend to a global section, is another way to say it, in grading zero. Using the language of harmonic extension, really helpful here. It turns out that it's the relative cohomology of the sheaf that is the obstruction to this extension problem. Similar result to what one has in harmonic analysis. Okay, remember that because that's going to show up a little bit later today. Let me talk about a very different sort of application of the sheaf Laplacian, one which I think is undervalued. This has to do with optimization. Consider the following setup. Let's say you've got a graph and you've got a sheaf of vector spaces over that graph. And to each vertex, you've got a convex functional. You've got a mapping from that uh, stock, from that vector space to the reals, a nice convex mapping. Think of it as a cost function. And, and what I want to do is, is choose an element in my stock that minimizes my personal cost. But this is a global system. This is a sheaf, and it's programmed with all of these restriction mappings. And the problem is I want to minimize the total cost. I want to minimize the sum of everybody's individual costs subject to a constraint. The constraint is that I need for everybody's individual choice to agree in the sense that I want a global section of the sheaf. That sounds a little bit abstract. To make it more concrete, think about a discourse sheaf, like we talked about yesterday, where the vertex stocks are people's private opinions. If everyone has a cost function on what it costs to move your opinions, and you want to minimize that, well, of course, everyone would just pick their own minimum. But if we have to be in agreement, if we all have to agree to get along, what's the, what's the least cost way to get everyone to change their opinions so that we have public agreement while minimizing the total personal cost? That's what this optimization problem is. The solution to it is to use the sheaf Laplacian. The details of this are going to be really familiar to anyone who has taken or taught a, a basic optimization course, but it's going to be 
uh, weird if if that's not your thing. The classic way to do something like this is to form a Lagrangian. And here I'm using a variable x that is in the cochains, the zero cochains on the sheaf. And then I have a dual set of variables, lambda. And if you set up a set of differential equations that are primal dual saddle point dynamics using the sheaf Laplacian, then what you can prove very, very easily is that the system will converge asymptotically to the optimal solution. This is a classic technique in constrained optimization problems. But what's cool about this, what is very cool about this, is that all of the computations involved in solving these differential equations are local computations. The sheaf Laplacian involves reading your internal state and communicating with your immediate neighbors as mediated by the edges. That means there's no central authority that has to figure out what the optimal solution is. Just by passing local data to your neighbors, the entire system can converge to a global optimum. It's a little hard for me to describe how exciting that type of application of a sheaf Laplacian is to me. This is very, very generalizable. And I think it's just the beginning of a, what might be a very significant and useful set of tools in distributed optimization problem. To the point that I would, I would say that this is a prime example of homological programming. If you take an optimization course, you learn linear programming. Linear programming is doing optimization under constraints of linear equalities and inequalities. Linear programming is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's how we schedule airlines. It's how we get Amazon to deliver stuff. It's how the world works. Homological programming, where you have, instead of just linear inequality constraints, where you have homological constraints, where I program sheaves and I need to have local or global sections. This is a completely unexplored area of intersection between algebraic topology and applications, optimization in particular. I think there's a lot of cool stuff to be done there, but Goodbye, we're moving on to something else because we have so much to talk about today. I've given a hint already in that simple example of optimization on a sheaf of using some differential equations, using some dynamics. I wanna drill down on that for much of the rest of today's talk and consider what happens when we start doing dynamics on sheaves. Network dynamics is a really big area in engineering, in applied mathematics. There's almost nothing that has been done to lift that subject up to more general data structures. And sheaf theory is really the right set of tools to be able to handle it. In order to make things nice and concrete, I want to go back to what we talked about yesterday with opinion dynamics. Recall the classic story where we just have a, if you will, a constant sheaf with one dimensional stocks. That is everybody has an opinion over one particular idea, one particular question like, what do you think of this tie? It's kind of outrageous. I'm wearing it on purpose to elicit a response. Maybe negative, maybe you don't care, maybe positive, probably not. Now the classic result for what happens when you have opinions distributed over a network and you evolve through local communication over time, is the following result of Taylor, 1968. He used the graph Laplacian, 
to predict what would happen over time. And the result is this. Let x be the vector of scalar valued opinions over the nodes of your social network. So the initial condition, everyone's got different opinions. But as people talk and share their opinions and change their opinions, you can set up a heat equation. This is the combinatorial heat equation using the graph Laplacian L instead of the analytic Laplacian. Here alpha is some small positive scalar. And what you do is you evolve the opinions according to the Laplacian. That means everyone talks to their neighbors, registers the, the disagreement with their neighbors, and then moves their internal opinion just a tiny bit to come closer to agreement. That's a continuous time dynamical system. A discrete time dynamical system would involve replacing that smooth derivative on the right with a finite difference and using n as a time step. This works a little bit better. This looks a little bit nicer if we just move the right hand side over. And then we can think of the evolution operator as being the identity minus some small positive multiple of the graph Laplacian. Remember that evolution operator. We're going to see him again tomorrow. Whether you use continuous time or discrete time, the classical theorem is that every initial opinion distribution evolves to consensus in the asymptotic limit. Whereby consensus, I mean that everybody agrees, or at least locally everybody agrees. Because of course, if you had a disconnected network, the connected components could come to different consensus values. Okay, that's cool. That's 1968. What does that mean? Does that mean that uh, everyone agrees? Yes. Over time, over a social network, people do politics, everybody comes to agreement. And because the rate of convergence is based on the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian, what that means is that the more connected your social network is, the faster you come to consensus. So here in this modern age where we have Twitter, where we have Facebook, where we're connected to so many more people than usual, this means that in uh, topics of opinions, political discussions, things like that, we all come to consensus really, really fast. It's proof. That is not really my experience of being on Twitter, which I often have to just shut off. I don't even go to Facebook anymore. Um, it didn't work out that way. And so much of the recent work in opinion dynamics is trying to explain polarization, trying to explain the influence of propaganda, uh, trying to explain destabilization of opinion dynamics. So let's walk down that road a little bit and let's update our tools from that simple scalar valued data structure, a constant sheaf, to a much more general discourse sheaf where each vertex, each person has a vector space of private opinions, might be very different dimension from vertex to vertex. The things that we're discussing over pairwise conversations, over edges, might differ. The things that you and I talk about are going to be different than the things you talk about with your neighbor, different than the other neighbor. Recall how that works, where the maps from the vertex stocks to the edge stocks are formulations of opinions. I, I take my core beliefs, my basis opinions, and whatever the topic of discussion is for today, I'm going to formulate an initial opinion based on what's inside. As we talk about it, as I see that there's disagreements on different topics, I might, I might change my beliefs a little bit. You might change yours a little bit. Let's try to tell the same story, but this time using the sheaf 
Laplacian. And let's lift some of these classical results. Now, I said yesterday that one of the things that I like so much about these discourse sheaves is that they make it easy to explain to someone who's just learning what all of these different algebraic topological constructs mean. They have nice interpretations. The zero cochains are pinion distributions, which are private. The one cochains are pairwise discussions, public. The co-boundary is giving you some measure of aggregate public disagreement. The Laplacian, in this case, is doing what? I've got my personal opinions. I talk with all my neighbors and I register the disconnect with them. And then I pull back to see what would I have to change internally to get along better with my neighbors. And that net ag aggregate change is what the value of the Laplacian is at a particular node. And now we have a really nice interpretation for the global sections for the zero dimensional cohomology. These are literally harmonic opinion distributions. They are distributions where everybody is in agreement and they are literally harmonic. Okay, so let's reprove the old Taylor theorem in this much more general context. Here's the theorem if we use the sheaf Laplacian to set up a heat equation on opinions. This is going to be the exact same equations either in continuous time or discrete time, but now x is a zero cochain. It's an opinion distribution over the social network. And here L is the sheaf Laplacian on zero cochains. If you start off with any initial opinion distribution, run these dynamics either in continuous or discrete time, you will converge exponentially to the closest harmonic distribution. You will converge not to global consensus, but to the closest global section to the sheaf. Now, remember, we've put enough information so that there's some geometry on these vector spaces. So we really can talk about orthogonal projection onto the global sections thought of as sitting inside of the zero cochains, since it's a kernel of the Laplacian. The proof of this theorem is really no more difficult than the proof of the original Taylor result back in 1968. It all has to do with the spectrum, with the eigenvalues of the sheaf Laplacian in this case. The sheaf Laplacian, like the graph Laplacian, is a positive semi-definite operator, blah, 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 blah. You control the eigenvalues, you control the dynamics, you control the global sections. But what does this mean? Does this mean that everybody agrees? It does not mean that everybody agrees. The private opinions are still private opinions. The way that you're expressing those private opinions in order to come to public consensus might be modulated. You might feel much more strongly about the the topic that you're discussing, then you project. You might even be a little bit disingenuous. You might be lying a little bit to some of the people that you're talking to. So it's not that everybody comes to the same beliefs, but rather that everybody has come to a public consensus. This is not unlike what happens with, oh, I don't know, let's say, department meetings in an academic department where in the end we all have to make decisions and come to agreement on things but privately we might not agree. This is just the beginning however. 
recall that there are some other things that we can do with this language of harmonic sections, harmonic co-chains. In particular, harmonic extension is going to be very useful to us. One thing that this model that we've been discussing does not take into account is people who are stubborn, people who don't change their opinions or who do so very, very reluctantly. How could you model such agents in a system? Well, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is you modify the sheaf. One is you modify the dynamics on the sheaf. Consider the following that is of the latter type. And this is, of course, motivated by ideas of propagandists who are just willfully putting out information and are not going to be listening to any of their neighbors. It's almost like a directed edge in the social network. So consider the following. Let's say that you modify the heat equation to a hybrid sort of system where you've got the regular heat equation for most people, but there's some dedicated subset, you, the propagandists, the people who have their fingers in their ears and won't listen, but will only talk. And there, you just zero out the dynamics. They're not going to budge. What happens to this system that is diffusive off of this subset? Well, it's basically the same thing. Every initial condition is going to converge to something, but what it's going to converge to is not the closest global section, but the closest harmonic extension of the initial condition as dictated by the propagandists by the stubborn agents, which themselves, that, that might not be a global section. Now, the interesting question here is, to what degree can you control that harmonic extension? Does it exist? Is it unique? We've shown that it always exists, and the uniqueness problem is controlled by an obstruction. The obstruction to uniqueness is, as it usually is, a cohomology class. In this case, it's the zero-dimensional relative cohomology of x rel u with coefficients in the sheaf. If that vanishes, then we have a unique harmonic extension. That's kind of interesting. That's kind of interesting. We'll circle back to that in a minute. Maybe what you want is not people who are pure propagandists, who are entirely inflexible. Maybe what you want is to be able to model degrees of suggestibility or degrees of inflexibility. How would you do something like uh, parametrized stubbornness? Here's, here's an interesting way to do it. To model purely stubborn agents, what we did was we changed the dynamics. To get a parametrized version of that, let's change the sheaf itself. I like this idea very much. Let's change the underlying graph by appending a vertex that connects to its child, as it were. Each vertex has a prior, a stubborn prior. Think of it as a parent. And the parent says something and just keeps saying it and will not stop saying it. Whereas the original agent, the child, now talks to the rest of the network, but is also influenced by that stubborn prior. If you build this modified sheaf over this appended graph and make all of those parents stubborn agents with the prior dynamics that we had on there, 
then what this allows you to do is put a parameter over each edge and have tunable stubbornness for each of the original agents. That's a nice way to modify the underlying sheaf in order to program the system to do what you want. I've hinted at the idea of propagandists trying to influence the outcome of information moving over a social network. It's time to go full dystopian and talk about the degree to which it's possible to control other people's opinions. If you posit a model for opinion distributions, the way that we've done so, if you posit diffusion dynamics using a sheaf Laplacian, to what degree can you control other people's opinions by carefully placed propaganda? Please don't get mad at me yet. I'm gonna walk this back in just a minute. Let me be dystopian for just a just 120 seconds. What happens if we wanna be evil? Well, recall yesterday, I talked about a way to encode a discrete time linear control system over a really, really simple sheaf. And you don't know, you don't need to know anything about control theory other than a little bit of terminology. We had these user inputs. These are, these are inputs to a control system. And we had these observable outputs. That's going to echo in what comes next. Let's go back to a discourse sheaf. Let's say that our system has evolved to a harmonic distribution. We have a harmonic zero co-chain of opinions. Let's say that there's some subset of people who are the propagandists. They're the user inputs to the control system. And we have some people who are the targets. They're the, the ones whose opinions we're going to observe and maybe try to drive. Then what are the obstructions to being able to control or force the system? using what we know about harmonic extensions, this relative H upper zero sheaf cohomology with respect to the propagandists, the users, you, that's the obstruction to controllability of the system. The dual obstruction to observability is the zero dimensional relative cohomology with respect to the observers, why? Uh, what is this? mean, I apologize for the control theoretic language, what this means is that if you pick your favorite global section for the sheaf, this is the opinion of, uh, pardon me, this is the opinion distribution I want the entire network to have. Can you drive the system to that by controlling only the opinions of you? And the answer to that depends on this cohomology class. The obstruction to being able to drive the system to a global consensus state exactly where you want it is whether or not this relative cohomology class vanishes. Is that scary? It sounds scary. I understand it sounds scary. Is this scary in theory? Absolutely. Is this scary in practice? I don't believe so. In order to be scary in practice, this particular model would have to be how opinion dynamics actually works. I'm not convinced of that. It would also require knowing a ton of information about how everybody expresses their internal states. Mm -mm. No, you ain't getting that. There are things to worry about when you start doing mathematics that has social implications. Don't get me wrong, please worry about those things. I don't think that in this particular case, this is entirely something to worry about. Why? Let me take a moment and critique 
the model that I've set up as being such a cool model, such a great model. It is cool, but I don't think it's actually how we do politics. I don't think it's actually an accurate model for what's happening with opinions because it posits that people change their mind and that's not an easy thing to do. If we go back to the the kind of stupid example that I set up yesterday for a simple discourse chief where we're trying to decide whether we should go walk to town and get some lunch and you have your opinions about uh, whether you feel like walking, how hungry you are, and I have my opinions about what I'm hungry for, and oh yeah, let's go. And there's a disconnect, it doesn't quite match. So maybe, maybe we talk about it for a few minutes and then we come to consensus. What does it mean in the model that we've set up to come to consensus? It means that you change your internal state so that your expression changes. And I change my internal state so that my expressed opinion agrees with yours. Is that really accurate? Have you suddenly become more hungry because we need to come to consensus and do something? I, I don't think that's an accurate model. So what could we do to improve things a bit make this more accurate. I think there's a very, very cool idea that is buried in this paper with Jacob that people have not yet realized what you can do with it. This is evolving not on the space of co-chains, but rather evolving in the space of sheaves, putting a differential equation, putting a heat equation not on opinion distributions, but on the sheaves themselves. Here's a short result about what happens when you do that. Let's say you start off with an initial condition, a zero cochain, an opinion distribution, and it's not a global section, but now we're gonna set up the dynamics so that nobody changes their opinion. Everybody stays exactly the same, but what you change is the maps. You change what you say. You evolve those maps from the stock data over the vertex to the stock data over the edge, and you evolve that by a heat equation using the sheaf Laplacian. I'm going to write out a an expanded out version of it that doesn't have the Laplacian explicitly in there, just because this is a lot simpler to write down. You can see the paper for some details. If you run this heat equation on the space of discourse sheaves, then the result is that this will converge to the closest discourse sheaf for which your initial opinion distribution is a global section. Let me say that again. If instead of changing your personal beliefs, you change what you say to people, using a heat equation to try to get closer and closer to consensus, then you will evolve to a discourse sheaf in which everybody publicly is in agreement while maintaining your own private opinions. And by closest, I mean details, details, squared for BD's norms. Okay, again, just to illustrate what's happening, you know, you've got an opinion on what you think about uh, this talk. Oh, it's a great talk, or it's whatever, or it's a terrible talk. And maybe you, maybe you share your opinion, frankly, with the person sitting to your left and to your right. And there's, there's a disconnect, there's a disagreement. Instead of changing your opinion, what could happen is you change the, um, the extremeness with which you express that opinion. In other words, we all just learn to communicate better and then we all get along. This idea of evolving in a space of sheaves, very, very cool. All of this is, is really just the beginning of what I think is potentially a lot of very cool applications.
the difficulty as always is that it's really hard to get people outside of topology to appreciate what we have, what kinds of ideas we thought about decades and decades before the rest of the world. Uh, the language barrier is real, but having some simple examples, like some of the ones that I've talked about, I'm hopeful will provide a bridge to allow us to communicate better with people who are not topologists. And in particular, working in vector spaces is something that anybody with a basic undergraduate mathematics education or engineering education can do. And it's a nice place to play around. But closing remark, you know, vector spaces, they're only so interesting and they can only do so much. It would really be nice to move past that and do some more interesting sheaf cohomology, some more interesting applications, hopefully. And that is what we're going to focus on tomorrow, is moving beyond vector space coefficients. And with that, I will once again thank you for your patience, and I'll be happy to take any questions.